Good morning, Southland. How are you? Thank you. Thank you, Herbie. Let's stand and worship. We're so glad that you're here. If you're with us online, please worship with us. We are one church body worshiping our Lord and Savior together. Let's sing together.
Dear Heavenly Father, we come here today to shout Hosanna and praise you for who you are. We come here every week to do that. But God, I pray that every single week we come here, you will renew us with your spirit, renew in us the steadfast love that you give to us. And God, we praise you for your greatness and your goodness and your mercy for all the days of our life. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
single day. I give you my life. I give you my trust. Jesus. And you are my God. And you are enough. Jesus.
Good morning, Southland. It's great to be back. Stephanie and I have been spending a couple weeks at what are called camp meetings. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever been to a camp meeting before, uh, but it's somewhere in the woods, and they have all of these little cottages that people stay in or dorm rooms, and uh, it, it, it truly is uh, roughing it a little bit, but you get to dial in on what the Lord is saying to you. The, the second one that, we went to, that I went to, uh, where I preached, this is actually my 10th sermon in 11 days. Uh, was, they're, they're really great experiences. It's not like work, and it's just really a joy. But these people in this second one, they, they live in like tool sheds. I don't know how to explain it other than that. And, and th that just shows the commitment, the level of commitment to come 10 days to a place to seek God. So I was glad to be part of it, but I really appreciate you all praying for us while we were gone. Stephanie's been leading the ch children's ministry at the first camp meeting for 33 years. 33 years. I mean, she's seeing, yeah, too bad. She, it's all for you, Steph, wherever you are. She, she's uh, telling me now that she's actually seeing children in the children's ministry there that are the grandchildren of some of the children she had when she first started. Uh, so that's, it's an amazing thing, and, and uh, I'm grateful. Again, I just want to say thank you for praying for us while we were away. Um, I, I, uh, I want to start today with, I have this little college miracle uh, that happened in my life. I was a freshman at a, at a little Bible college, and uh, I honestly got to this point where, in the semester, where I didn't have any money, zero money, not one penny. And my tuition payment was coming up. Uh, I needed some soap and some shampoo, and the other students on campus felt like I needed some soap and shampoo. And, and it was really a, a, a rough time, and I was wondering if I was gonna be able to stay there. And, and then, honestly, out of, out of the blue, I went to my mailbox in the dorm, opened it up, and there was an envelope. And there was all the money I needed for tuition, soap, and uh, shampoo, and even toothpaste on top of that. And, and it was from a source who wasn't a believer. Well, it wasn't, I mean, here I am training for the ministry, and this person just felt like they should send me some money, and it was the money I needed. So I call that my little college miracle, except at that moment, it was far from little. It was amazing, and it taught me something, that God, despite the fact the Bible teaches us he does miracles, still does miracles. And, and I believe that. I, I believe God is still performing miracles in people's lives today. But it's one thing to say I believe it, and it's another thing to pray expecting them to happen. That's the challenge we all have as people of faith. Um, an example of that, honestly, is I've been praying together with our leaders, and our leaders have been praying here at Southland, both our elders and, and finance team leaders and things like that, that we're still living this dream of paying off the mortgage on this beautiful facility in, in a total of five years. Now, here's the thing. We're three years into this, and, and we're trusting now that he's going to give us all we need to pay it off in, in, in less than two years. Now, now the, here's the beauty of that. You know, we talk about talking about money and stuff like that. It, it really is, uh, it, it takes money to do the kind of things that we do, and people have been such faithful givers. F for example, let me just do the math with you because they actually did teach us math in Bible college. It was $6.4 million for the whole project, and in three years, this congregation stepped up and gave us, not just pledged, gave us $3.2 million dollars. And so we only needed half of the total cost, and we went to a wonderful organization, the Wesleyan Investment Foundation, which the only thing they do with their money is build churches. And they were happy to partner with us to, to borrow the other half of the construction. And, and what's amazing about that is every dime of interest that we pay them goes to building more churches. You can't beat that. And so here's, here's what's, what's beautiful, and you're gonna say, really beautiful? Since we started paying the mortgage uh, three years ago, We've paid off $664,000 of the balance. Now, now, a lot of that is way beyond what we owed if, at that point in terms of monthly payment. Get this. With your generous giving, the people who have been generous toward this mortgage at Southland, along with all the other generous giving, we've already saved $1,338,271 in interest. I mean, that's money we don't have to pay because... God's people stepped up and said, I'm going to be part of this. I'm going to own this ministry, and I'm going to give of my harder dollars and my wealth to it. Now, here's the thing. I've always said that this really isn't about math. It's about faith. 
It's about people saying, I'm going to do above and beyond anything I could have ever asked or imagined because I believe so much in what God's doing in people's lives in this church and through our ministry. So I want to start a series today. A series that is intentionally and unapologetically about believing and seeing God still perform the miracle of paying off the remaining two and a half million dollars by June the 3rd, 2024. By the end of that five years that we believed. You see, it's a big number. And yet I'm convinced that we have a big God. And I'm convinced we have people in this room and people with us online and people who are part of the Southland family who have big faith and have big obedience to God. And so I still believe he's going to provide that miracle. I just believe he's going to provide it through you and me and our desire to see it happen. Now, through you and me doing generously above and beyond anything we've ever done before, this is honestly pretty easy. We've proven that with the math, but God's gonna get all the glory when it happens. Because right now, you know, there's, there could be that doubt. You know, well, people don't give to a mortgage like they give to a building program, and you know, I hear all that. But here's what God says. I called you to this. You believed me, and everybody stepped up to be part of it. Now just keep trusting me, and keep looking into my word to get your direction. So that's what we're gonna do today. I want to build a foundation of faith with one big question, a macro question, that leads into three micro questions. And here's the big question. Here it is for you and me. Am I a hoarder? Now, there you go. Nothing gets more spiritual sounding than a question like that, right? Am I a hoarder? Now, a hoarder is a person who gathers an excessive amount of items and stores them. We put stores in quotation marks there because they can't let them go. They just accumulate. And and we find Jesus actually talking to some potential hoarders or actual hoarders in the Sermon on the Mount. So I'm gonna take you back to the Sermon on the Mount for a couple weeks. Uh, If you'll open your Bibles or if you have the Bible on your device, Turn to Matthew chapter 6, and and while you're going there, I just want to remind you of what the Sermon on the Mount was really all about. Jesus shows a contrast in his Sermon on the Mount between what it means to live in the kingdom of God versus living in the kingdoms of this earth. Because we tend to get all of our focus and all of our attention and all our priorities on the stuff we do in this earth when he's saying, I got a much bigger, better kingdom for you to live in. So after showing them how to truly live in the kingdom of life, he shows them how that means it supersedes all of the rules and laws and regulations that have been heaped upon them by the religious leaders of their day. And he starts teaching them how to live for the glory of God and the blessing of others in every day of their life. And he says, by the way, that really applies to the people in your life that are just a pain in the neck. That's where you really discover kingdom living. And so chapter 6 starts with an emphasis on generously giving to the needy and generously living a life of prayer. And then he says this in Matthew 6, beginning with verse 19. Don't store up treasures here on earth where they can be eaten by moths and get rusty and where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven where they will never become moth-eaten or rusty, and where they will be safe from thieves. Because wherever your treasure is, there your heart and thoughts will be also. Now, if we're honest, we get a little bit tired of Jesus constantly exposing who we really are in his teaching, don't you? I mean, it's like, come on, Jesus, give me a break. But here it is, here's the reality. Who you are is, a great ref- uh, is reflected often in how you use the accumulated stuff in your life. The accumulated resources in your life show the world exactly what's important to you, show the world exactly who your master is. Now, in the beginning of chapter 6, Jesus talks about things that we don't do publicly. Giving, praying, fasting, those things that we're supposed to keep between him and us. But then he decides to expose publicly our true ambitions, even if we haven't seen them in ourselves. And it leads us, what he has to say here leads us to three questions. 
First of all, what do I have? Second of all, what do I wish I had? And third, what do I live for? And that's honestly all I wanna unpack for you today to build a foundation of kingdom life. Now, there's the first question, what do I have? Let me press rewind again, back to what we call the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter five, the beginning of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Again, they show us how to become a citizen of a heavenly kingdom instead of an earthly kingdom. And that's the decision we make here when we read those words. To become a citizen of the kingdom that goes far beyond the boundaries of tangible creation that you now experience and see and live with every day. Jesus is showing us how we live for more than time and space and this earthly life. He draws the contrast between treasures in heaven and treasures on earth, our material ambitions. I mean, you have some goals right now? Goals for how much you want in a fund? Goals for something that you hope to acquire or buy? He's trying to draw the contrast between living those ambitions through a kingdom lens instead of an earthly lens. Now, I love how he uses practical pictures of our stuff. Don't store up, which is what can happen. We can accumulate stuff for our self-esteem, for our reputation, or even for our security. You know, we just need more money in case something bad happens, and so we're constantly accumulating it. And he says, you know, you realize, right, that the more stuff you get, uh, the more it ultimately rusts or moths come and eat it up, or thieves break in and steal it. You see, not in an earthly kingdom, because the things that you have in an earthly kingdom last forever, and I'll explain what he means by that. Have you ever said this? I might need that someday. Now, seriously, is my father-in-law the only one who ever said that? I might need that someday, and so you just keep it. And it goes in your basement or your attic or your garage or a closet, and you actually forget that you even have it, but you might need it someday. That's kind of what Jesus is talking about here. The contrast. You can own things that will never deteriorate. You can own things that will never be stolen. Well, how does that work? Well, basically, he's saying this. The only things you will absolutely take with you to heaven are the things you give away. Let me say it again. The only things you will absolutely take with you to heaven are the things you give away. The resources that God brings to your life that you begin to understand aren't just for your own comfort and pleasure, but they are actually for his glory and the blessing of other people. An example of that might be service or kindness or generosity or encouragement or sacrifice. And frankly, even your stuff is on that list. Where your treasure is, Jesus said, your heart will be also. Because your ambition to acquire is only temporary. Your ambition to give and serve is actually eternal, forever. So where is your heart? Where is your ambition, your treasure? I mean, what really gets you excited in life? And and it calls us then to take an inventory. Not just an inventory of the actual physical possessions we own or an inventory of what's in our bank accounts, but what about your time? And what about your giftedness, your abilities? You begin to take inventory of all of the resources, the relationships in your life, and you begin to ask yourself, are all of these involved in kingdom living? And then he gets very practical with the physical stuff and basically he's telling us, what do I have? And it causes me to say, I gotta take a walk. I gotta take a walk through my basement. I gotta take a walk through my attic. I gotta take a walk through my storage unit. Wherever I keep my stuff and make a list. Now, I gotta be honest, I'm gonna laugh at myself and and Stephanie, my wife, right now um, because we have this son of ours and he owns an online auction company. And, and I, d- I just want you to know that the auction company actually started to bless a mission on the south side of Lancaster, Ohio, where uh, there are definitely people struggling economically, and so they're there all the time to help them with childcare and with all their physical needs. 
And so this auction was meant to help that. Ultimately, it became Landon's business, and he has done his best to use it to continue that work in ministry, but also make a living for himself and his now four employees. Now, here's the problem with Landon's auction. Stephanie and I have become his best customers. <laughs> Hate that auction. You know, I mean, and, and for two different reasons. Number one, Stephanie just loves an amazing deal. I mean, if it's a great deal, it is the will of God. I mean, that's how it works for her. And then for me, I'm sitting here trying to drive the prices up so Landon makes more money. Unfortunately, I win way too many things on this auction. And so now we have this basement full of boxes of stuff that we've purchased, and we don't even know what's in the boxes. It's just accumulating in our basement. Don't judge me. It's true. <laughs> oh. pause. I'll pause right here while I go ahead and have the altar call for myself, and then I'll get back up here and finish the message. Well, what do I have? I have a lot of stuff that I don't need. Frankly, a lot of stuff I don't even want accumulating in my barns. It's not always easy to know our motives for what we seek to acquire or even what we seek to achieve. And so Jesus goes on. Verse 22 of chapter 6. Your eye is a lamp for your body, and a pure eye lets sunshine into your soul. But an evil eye shuts out the light and plunges you into darkness. If the light you think you have is really darkness, how deep that darkness will be. Now, you know, you take that, that passage out of the context that we've been talking about, and you can make that say just about anything. But you really need the question of the context to go with it, and it's this. Not only what do I have, but what do I wish I had? What am I desiring? Light versus darkness, he calls it, which many people have relegated simply to spiritual ambitions, but let's face it, our eye is the doorway to our heart. Jesus' reference to the eye is just another reference to our desires and ambitions. A pure eye, he says, lets sunshine into your soul. In other words, where is your focus, your attention? What is it that you're looking for in life to satisfy you, fulfill you? But when you see by his spirit, you are able to clearly illuminate the rivals that are trying to distract, defeat, or destroy your citizenship in a heavenly kingdom. When you have all of, these comp competition, all of this competition for your attitude and your attention and, and your energy, you begin to be pulled into what he called darkness. If you're focused on only what this earth offers, you will ultimately be left unfulfilled and disappointed. So I honestly don't think any of you here are, are here by accident today. I think the Lord really wanted to awaken you to this reality. That isn't it great news? That with all the bad news you get on your news feeds, that here he is telling you, don't worry about this place. I mean, yeah, there are problems here. You want to make a difference here. You want to care here. You want to bring the light of Jesus here. But this isn't where you ultimately will live. You are a citizen of heaven. But Jesus says what happens is you can be deceived by your desires. He even calls the eye, his word, not mine, evil. If it's focused on the accumulation of this earth's stuff as somehow being the ultimate fulfillment that you're looking for. If the light you think you have is really darkness, he says, how deep the darkness will be. I mean, how endless will your pursuit of happiness and satisfaction be if you keep looking for it and accumulating more stuff? Evil versus light. Now, I'll be honest with you, I never thought of my stuff being evil until I realized that I never evaluated its impact on my priorities and my passions. So look at what you're pursuing through the lens of God's word, guided by God's spirit. And maybe when making a significant purchase, or any purchase, the question you always want on your mind is, how will this honor God and help me accomplish his purpose and mission for my life? 
Because, I mean, here, here, let me just ask you a question. Have you ever said this? There's nothing wrong with, and then you name the thing that you want to buy. There's nothing wrong with, right? I mean, we've all done that. There's nothing wrong with it. Well, first of all, you're right. For the most part, there's nothing wrong with that item or that thing in and of itself, whatever it is that you want to buy. But living in his kingdom makes you rise above there's nothing wrong with. There's nothing wrong with causes you to settle for so much less than what God wants you to enjoy as a heavenly kingdom liver. As a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, you want your life to be about all of your resources devoted to God's glory rather than just your comfort, your pleasure, or your reputation. See, often there's nothing wrong with is simply your attempt to make yourself feel better about what it is you're acquiring. Come on, be honest. I mean, it's just us here. Be honest. You've done it. You're acquiring something you would, your eye admires rather than putting all of your resources toward the things that enable you to not only honor God, but to fulfill his mission, his calling in your life. So I'll be honest with you. I'm not walking out in the parking lot after church today and judging you by the car you drive or the house that that, or, or apartment that that car will ultimately get to, or even right now, looking at what you're wearing. See, see, that's not the point of all of this. I'm simply encouraging you to ask yourself, is my eye full of light, or is it full of darkness? Attempting to get me to choose competitors for my affections instead of putting my affections on kingdom living. And after you inventory your true treasure, and you illuminate your true rivals, you'll see clearly enough to capture the ultimate purpose of Jesus' message. And here it is in verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Because this is what we're trying to capture is not only an inventory of what do I have, but we also want to be honest with ourselves as what it is we want and what we're looking at with our eyes and desiring. But then ultimately, all of that leads to that important question, what do I live for? And what is it that I'm existing here for? And so Jesus said, this is what can happen. That you can become such an earthly kingdom liver that you think so much that wealth and the accumulation of more stuff is somehow going to honor the life that you've been designed for, and it doesn't. It puts those things in competition with God. And so he's saying, really, what you need to do is not just control your ambitions, but turn all of your ambitions over to the God who made you and trust him with them. See, not only can we be fighting the wrong enemy, we can be serving the wrong master. And, and, and that's never more true than, honestly, when we go onto social media and we're watching, you know, hey, this person's celebrating this thing that they just got, or this amazing vacation that they're on, or all of the stuff that they now wear, it's so beautiful. And, and we can begin to compare ourselves to that. Look at their smiles. Look how happy that's making them. And subliminally, we could be actually believing that. And it affects the way we prioritize. So Jesus says, don't let the temporary wealth of this world be the master of you and take control of you. Don't let the values and the opinions of this world be the thing that drives your life. But rather, I've got a better idea. How about the God who designed you, created you, loved you, died for you, rose from the dead, and has offered you eternal life? I'm going to go with him. That's what Jesus says. Of course, the master he wants you to identify is in fact God himself that he can be trusted to lead your life. So be loyal to him and fight hard to follow him and guard your heart from his rivals, the rivals of greed and stuff and image. Uh, this past couple of weeks, I've been really fortunate to hang out with uh, one of my dearest friends, Franco Salvatore, his wife Stacy, their three kids. Franco at one time was a youth pastor here in Greenwood and felt called the seminary in Pennsylvania and then ultimately pastored a, a beautiful Mennonite church there. And they are just living the dream. I mean, doing ministry as a ministry family. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they felt called away from that to go to the Dominican Republic. 
They felt like God wanted them there, to care for people there, to help people in that developing country, and in doing that, share this beautiful love of Jesus with them. And yet there was only one way that they were gonna be able to do that, only one way that they were gonna be able to fulfill the mission that God put into their life, and that was to absolutely sell everything. Keep nothing, give it all away, sell it all, remove all of those burdens from their life so that they could go to the DR and do what God wanted them to do. So they did it. They liquidated all their assets, and then they asked people to join their team. I mean, that's humbling, men and women, to have to go to people and say, look, this is what we believe God wants us to do. We hope that you trust our faith, and we'd love for you to come along with us to pray for us daily and to give money to our mission. And they've done that, and they've trusted God for that, and they're now doing that. And that's what God's saying to all of you, to you, that everything in your life is simply a resource. And now your goal is to bring him glory and carry out his mission. And I know what you might be thinking. You might be saying, yeah, that's for missionaries. I'm not a missionary. (laughs) See, there you are, wrong again. You're on a mission. Each day, you are on a mission to carry out the call and will of God in your life. He doesn't just call preacher types and missionaries. He calls every one of us to accomplish things for his honor and his glory. And to accomplish that mission with the people God puts in your life, you first have to ask yourself, what do I have that I can utilize for that purpose? And then what do I live for? The answer is I live to accomplish God's call in my life. And so then I liquidate whatever stuff is getting in the way of that. I mean, the stuff that's in the garage and in the closet and whatever it is I have to do to give my life away for his glory and the good of others, he's saying, man, that's the best possible life you can live. That's what it means to be a citizen in the kingdom of heaven. Now, every day, forces are trying to distract you and pull you away from your true master. So you need to decide who is the true boss of you. Pastor Kerry Huffman, he's one of our Uh, associates here, he does discipleship and pastoral care, and and we've been in three churches together. When we first got together, I was a youth pastor, he was a children's director, and we were working together, and we'd get into this banter all the time, and inevitably, one of us would say to the other, you're not the boss of me. And that's how it would typically end, and then we'd go off somewhere and think of other mean things to say to each other. It's what ministers do. (laughs) Well, ultimately then, um, I invited Kerry to come on staff here and, and, uh, and serve us, and, and he felt this was where he was called to, so he came here, and we got into banter one day, and he started, he goes, you're not the, I guess you are. <laughs> well, see, you have to decide who is the boss of you. And Jesus is telling us that you can't be fully devoted to God's kingdom and also devoted to this earthly kingdom. He specifically used the word money. His word, not mine. He used it. For some reason, a lot of people think that we preacher types should preach about everything in the Bible except that one word, and yet Jesus talked about it often. Our possessions, our wealth, our money. And if financial and material success is your motivating ambition, then God is not your true master. He's not the boss of you. You're the boss of you. But if your desire for financial success is to use those resources to serve the Lord and bless others, you have truly identified him as your master. No matter how much you have, little or much, as long as it's all in the hands of God's direction, you have accomplished what it is to live as a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. So, okay, we had the macro question. We need to come back to that. Am I a hoarder? Meaning, do I hoard one thing for myself instead of for God's glory? I admit, I have been a hoarder. But that all ends today. As I think about the answers to those questions, what do I have? What do I wish I had? And what do I live for? And that's the question for you. What do you have? What do you have that you can use as a citizen of God's kingdom instead of the kingdoms of this earth? 
What do you wish you had? What's fighting for your affection? Distracting you from living in God's kingdom? And what do you live for? Declare to God your ambition in life is his glory. And that everything you have, all that you are, will be devoted to that end. To show people that there is, in fact, no more fulfilling, no more wonderful way to live than that. So back to the beginning, above and beyond. I mean, what does any of this have to do with that? Well, again, this is just the first message of four, but I gotta get this foundationally first before I can talk to you about all of the other aspects of what we'd like you to pray about. These are the questions you must first answer if you ever would think that our body could experience a miracle like we're talking about by June the 3rd, 2024. That's the date. That's the five-year date. That's what we're going for. And, and out in the hub, we put a little mountain out there. Um, you might not want to touch it because it just got finished being painted about 6.30 this morning. But the, that mountain represents the mountain we as a congregation as a body are trying to climb. Uh, that mountain represents a little over two and a half million dollars. And trusting that together, all of us doing our part, whatever our part is, we can achieve that by that date, June 3rd, 2024. And I'm asking you to simply nail down first the answer to those three questions about what you currently have and get an understanding of that. And what is it that has been in your mind's eye that has been drawing your attention and ultimately might draw your resources? And ask yourself, what do I live for? And maybe instead of saying there's nothing wrong with, maybe the better statement before you buy anything or use any of your accumulated resources, maybe the better statement is, what is this going to do to help me ultimately fulfill the mission God has me on. And I believe when we get the answers to our questions and we live our lives with that kind of focus, we will see God do things in us and through us that are above and beyond anything we could ever ask or imagine. And two and a half million dollars, <laughs> nothing to him through the faith and obedience of people who live in his kingdom. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much because you have demonstrated generosity above everyone else's expectations. Even creating us and then coming to this world to give us grace and eternal life is something we didn't deserve and yet out of the fullness of your love, you poured it out to us. And so today we pause and simply say thank you for that. But Lord, we want to be reflections of that in our world. We want to live in your kingdom. So we pray you'll help us even now to say to you, you are the leader of my life. All that I have, all that I am, I devote to you today. I give you all. And I pray, Lord, in helping people pray that prayer that you would give them a sense of peace and satisfaction knowing that they indeed have chosen your grace and chosen to be citizens of the kingdom of God. Help us to pray the prayers you want us to pray right now in Jesus' name. You, you pray your own prayer and you respond to what you've heard this morning from his word and his spirit and you ask him to open up your eyes to all that he's given you to use for his glory. You pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the people who call Southland their church and the great work you have done in their minds and hearts to draw them to your grace. Thank you for that. And we thank you for all of the tools you've given us to use in ministry. And we can't celebrate that enough. But we realize that it comes because men and women want their lives devoted to you. So we ask that you will hear the prayers of the people today, that you will show us all who we live for, 
and you will help us to give all to you. In the beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Come on, let's stand and let's continue to worship him and let this song be the prayer of your heart in response to his word today.
that's great news. Yeah, we no longer live in death, and we no longer live as citizens of the earth, but we live as citizens of the kingdom of God. What a great demonstration of generosity that God gave for us when he came to this world, gave up everything, all of heaven, to carry out his mission of your salvation. Man, it's worth living for. And I wanna say to all of you with us online, thanks so much for being part of our service today. We're grateful that you're here, and I hope you'll stick around for just a second as Pastor Nate talks a little bit more about how you can respond to what you heard today and experienced at Southland. God bless you, hope you're with us in person soon, but if not, keep joining us online and tell others about the great gift of Jesus Christ. Have a great week.